Good morning, Southside. I too want to welcome any guests who are visiting with us. We are grateful to have you and we get to worship our God together. We've been uh, working through a book on Sunday mornings by Paul David Tripp to kind of prepare our hearts for worship. And this morning he was talking that as we gather, we're being reminded of the greatest gift that we have is union with Jesus Christ. And so we, we get lost in the day and a lot of things come at us. And this is our time to reorient and to come worship and just be reminded again that you've been joined in a living, vital relationship to Jesus Christ. So uh, it should not be hard to worship this morning. What a beautiful gift we have. Uh, I got a good report on uh, Whitney Tijerina's surgery, and we want to continue just praying uh, for her and uh, her journey. And what a sweet testimony her and her husband have just been of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sufficiency with her brain tumor. Well, I want to continue to pray for our, our young marrieds. Um, it's been a season of much affliction uh, in that group, and hope in Creighton, who have been in this for several years with us. Creighton is the oldest in a pretty large family. I think he's 26. And uh, on Friday, his father passed away suddenly without any notice. And so um, if we could just be praying for them uh, during this time, they're back now with the family. And so we'll continue to lift that sweet couple up. Well, I wanted to share with you where we're going to be going for the next few weeks. Um, this morning, we're going to look at what Paul calls the sincerity of faith. And it's going to be kind of a, a topical sermon closing up all that we've been studying on abiding in Jesus Christ. And then next week, we're going to have communion together. What a privilege to remember the sacrificial death of Jesus together, the ordinance that he left to us on the night in which he was betrayed. February 11th, uh, I think I'm going to be preaching on Matthew 24, how, how to live in light of the second coming of Jesus Christ and the imminence and the signs and the things that we see growing in our, our very midst. And then February 18th, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be preaching at West Denver Bible Church. And then February 25th, I think we're going to begin uh, our, our new study. And uh, I've already preached this book once before, but I feel like God's giving me eyes to see in a whole new way. And this abiding in Jesus Christ, I want to preach through Philippians and just come each week together and stare at Jesus Christ and to worship him and then uh, probably follow up with First and Second Samuel. Uh, I, I'm holding out a, a possibility for Isaiah, which is called the fifth gospel uh, of Jesus. So I pray that, um, I pray we don't get to study any of those books. I, I pray that Jesus comes back and we get to worship by sight. Wouldn't that be sweet? For this to be over, and we won't have to remind each other by faith any longer. Uh, but until that day, let us pursue after Christ and holiness, without which no man will see the Lord. So with that, I do want to close up the last few months this morning. Uh, we went to John chapter 15, and we were looking at the beauties of abiding in Jesus Christ. Uh, we've looked then, uh, we, I think we spent three weeks on that. And then we moved into 1 John 1 is, how do we stay in a relationship with a holy God when, when we're, we're sinners? And he, he said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us from all our unrighteousness. So there's a way as sinners that we can stay in fellowship with the living God. And then we went to John 6, and, and we eat the bread of life, and we will hunger no more. What we have in Christ can fulfill every longing that you have. Then we looked at the trellis of the church and, and all that has been set up here at Southside Bible Church for us to plug in and to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then we were exhorted from Hebrews chapter 12, run the race that has been set before us, putting off these encumbrances and the sin which so easily entangles, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Last week, we, we took a look at uh, do not fear, give us the eyes of faith to see the chariots of, of fire that surround us, that our God is for us, and we can live by faith in everything that he brings into our lives. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Now this morning, for one last time, I'm going to try to bring this all together for God's glory and our good. And so John 15, the focus was on bearing fruit. If you'll remember three times, you'll bear fruit, you'll bear much fruit, and you're going to bear abundant 
fruit by abiding in Jesus Christ. And so when we are saved, we're joined to him like a vine and a branch, and now we, we abide. And it's organic, it's supernatural, and it bears a fruit that no human can bear in and of themselves. There's a fruit that can only come by living by faith in Jesus Christ. And so I want to look more at that fruit this morning and how does it come about and just put a bow on this whole study that we've been laboring with together. And I want to make it as clear and as simple as possible. I don't want profundity. I just want conformity to Christ. I want us all growing to look like Jesus so that the whole earth hears about our faith in Jesus and its power to the praise and the glory of Jesus Christ. So let me just read the foundation passage that we're going to look at this morning, and then we'll go to the throne of grace and ask God to meet us in this beautiful passage, because this is the will of God, your sanctification. First, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3. Paul said, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I, I betrothed you, church at Corinth, I betrothed you to one husband, that to Christ, I might present to you a pure virgin, but I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness back into Genesis, that your minds should be led astray from what? The simplicity and the purity of devotion to Jesus Christ. The, there's an enemy who wants to lead you away from the simplicity and the purity of a devoted life to Jesus Christ. All hell is set against you to live into that simplicity. And Paul says, I, I'm afraid that the way the, the devil led Eve into, by his craftiness away from it, that your minds might lose that simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. It's, it's to lose your first love and the Savior. And so I want to come and, and fight against that this morning. Sin just opposes a simple surrender to Christ. It just, it fights it. The, the enemy fights it. The world system fights a simple surrender. John Newton said, I've made thousand such surrenders to him. And a thousand times I've interpretively retracted them. Our flesh, our remaining sin, fights a simple surrender of simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus Christ. This is the fight of faith, brethren that we have been fighting together for several months. This is the authentic Christian life. And through my journey, my fear has been to, to not be found inauthentic on the last day. I don't want to be deceived by the enemy. And in Matthew 7, when Jesus preaches one of the greatest sermons ever preached, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And so not everyone who says, you're my Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But who does the will of my Father who is in heaven is the one. Many will say to me on that last day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? They're seeing power. And I'll declare to them, I never knew you Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There, there's a, a profession that has a life that completely denies that profession. And on the last day, it's going to be drawn out. And so we're all saying, I don't want to be inauthentic. I want to be the real deal. And that's what I want to look at this morning. So this is what I'm after in my own heart and in those I shepherd, that not one of you be inauthentic. A life that's lived as a branch that was never attached to the vine. It's cut off. It's fruitless. No fruit ever came because it wasn't attached to Jesus Christ. So I know this is weighty, but we can't allow ly lies and false teaching and apathy and deceit to take this reality of true authentic Christianity versus a false profession and remove it wrongly and die and find out that you were deceived. So here's what I'm after this morning. I'm a minister for your joy. I want you walking with Jesus Christ in authenticity 
And the fruit that that will produce is an abundant life so that your joy may be made full. And this is the life that Jesus has promised and he came to give and what we've been studying. It's not a life of hypocrisy with no power and despair and no growth. And so I want us to have the abundant life that Jesus gives. And so I want to read a few verses of what I'm going to go after this morning. In Philippians 1.10, we'll get there soon. Paul says, I pray so that you may approve the things that are excellent. You'll, you'll know from the Word of God the things that are excellent in this life in order for the purpose that you'll be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ when he returns. The word for blameless means void of offense, a clear conscience before God and man, that we want to live before God with a clear conscience before him and before each other. And the word for sincere, that Greek word is a beautiful word. It meant tested by sunlight. And what would happen in the market is you had these, these vases, let's say, and, and, and there, if there was a crack or something in them, you would fill it in with wax and paint over it. And what you would do when you went into the market to buy one, you'd, you'd hold it up in the sunlight and you could see if, there, if, the, if it was fake, if it was insincere, if there were cracks in it. And so this is a God holding us up in the light of his perfect knowledge, uh, looking for a sincerity before God, to be pure, to be the real thing, to be the genuine article, not phony or hypocritical. So this is what we're after, brothers and sisters, and this can come gradually by abiding in Jesus Christ. Abiding in Jesus Christ makes the real deal, and it bears a fruit that comes from this relationship. And so I want you to come with me then to the throne of grace to pray for this in each one of us, to be a church unified in helping each other grow into this place, to live as authentic Christians, to not lose hope in the insincerity that remains in our flesh and fights hard against this. You have remaining sin that's going to fight this. May God grant us much grace in our pursuit of sincerity, of simplicity and purity, of devotion to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would bear this fruit in each one of our lives. God, this is what we've been looking at. We want this much fruit. We're learning how to abide. And I pray this morning now that you'll bring it to the next step of helping us learn how to be the, the authentic, sincere believer who walks in your presence and lives for you. So God, I pray if there are any in our midst, who are pseudo. Please don't let them on the last day say, Lord, Lord, and you say, away from me, I never knew you. God, deal with us each individually in truth. As we open up this word this morning, have your way in each one of our hearts. Lord, let the tender conscience not fall into a place they shouldn't. And let the hardened one be, be brought to repentance this morning. And so, Lord, you're the only one who can figure these things out. We commit this time to you, and I pray that the, the fruit would be a, an amazing sincerity in Southside Bible Church. So, God, do what no human can do. We look to you to produce this in our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 1 Timothy 1.5, Paul tells us what the goal of all his teaching is. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a, a good conscience and a sincere faith. This authenticity, a sincere, genuine faith. That's what we're teaching. That's what we desire. That's what we want to see come from the Word of God. Peter says in 2 Peter 3.1, this is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, this, this genuine mind that wants to please God and knows Him and loves Him. In Hebrews 10.22, the writer says, let us draw near with a sincere heart, with this genuine, real heart and full assurance of faith 
having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water to, to give us this cleansing to have a sincere heart as we draw near to God. And then Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 1.12, our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we've conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. We, we've acted in sincerity and genuineness and purity before you. And so I want to learn this gospel simplicity this morning that produces sincerity of heart and life. Paul's telling us that the devil will try to deceive us and lead us away from it. He'll always be trying to get you away from this message. And so I pray that your ears are perking up. And as I've been reading Hudson Taylor and John Newton, this last chapter I read and John Newton addresses this issue, so I'm going to borrow heavily from him. And I want to share the things that he's taught me on this with you this morning. And then I'm going to put my Newton book away for at least a year, okay? I know you're, I'm overdoing it, but that's what I do. When I was a kid, I'd go buy these little 45 records. They're, they're little small ones, and I would play that thing 50 times straight. I just wear things out. I'm sorry. Okay, forgive me. Yeah, I only share what he said that's backed up by Scripture and I want to stand on the shoulders of this giant of the faith this morning. So from Paul's quote from 2 Corinthians 11, 3, the Christian life is to be this simplicity of devotion to Christ. It's so sweet. You, you can boil it down to one thing, as we saw in Philippians 3. And I want to help you get this piece. Any move away from simplicity of devotion to Christ is the definition of sin. Every sin will be trying to lead you away from that. For Newton, the Christian life boiled down to this question. How do I maintain constant, undistracted, unmixed, single-hearted devotion to Christ? How do I maintain that is the battle. And we've answered that by abiding in Jesus Christ. We, we have learned that that's where it's going to come from is this abiding by faith in the fullness of all that Christ is. And so I want to try and make that answer even clearer, like focus in the camera, which I believe is the entire Bible this morning. And, and I've, been, I've been reading John. Uh, I love that Jason's teaching the gospel of John because this is what it is. This is what that whole gospel is pointing to. If you're not in a community group, go get in the gospel of John. Tuesday nights? Tuesday nights. It's on the wall back there. That's for free, right, Jay? Um, so Newton boils it down, and I'm going to use this phrase. I like that he, it's called gospel simplicity. And it's the simplicity of the, the gospel applied to our lives. And, and the, the writer of his uh, book that I'm reading, Tony Reinke, he said, a life of gospel simplicity is a life focused on Christ and all his sufficiency. That's what we've been learning about abiding in the vine. Uh, his fullness and all that he is. It's a life in which we're aware of our sin and our lostness and confident of what Christ has done on our behalf. You're so aware of your lostness, but you're so aware that Christ has done everything necessary to redeem that and to save it. What we can call gospel simplicity is the essence of the Christian life. And no true character will be found where these simple convictions have not been grasped by the heart. A simple-hearted heart. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You'll never build any true character, he says, without grasping the gospel of Jesus Christ. So my question is, where everything's been moving, is how do we know, excuse me, when gospel simplicity has taken root in our lives? And Newton believes it comes in two forms. And scripture will prove this out clearly. And first, he says, when we have a simplicity of intention and when we have a simplicity of dependence. So two simple concepts that I want to look at first. That's going to be how you know this is broken in. So let's start with the simplicity of intention. And I've been pounding on this drum since Southside started 25 years ago. The simplicity of intention, says Newton, implies that we have one leading aim. 
to which it is our deliberate an unreserved desire that everything else in which we are concerned may be subordinate and subservient in a word, that we are devoted to the Lord, and we have by grace been able and able to choose Him and to yield ourselves to Him, so as to place our happiness in God's favor and to make His glory and will the ultimate scope of all of our actions. And so we've been redeemed to make God everything, to make his glory now where before self-glory is what owned you, controlled you, and led you, and you've been redeemed, you've been made new to have a whole new chief in. And it's not you, it's God. And everything that you are and everything that you do is simplicity. It's for God, it's for his glory, it's for his aim, his end. My heart has been circumcised now to not want the praise of men, but the approval of God. That's what being born again does in a heart. And in flesh, remaining sin can mess with it, entangle with it. But at the core of your being now, God is your chief end if you've come to Jesus Christ. That's why for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. We've been created to find our all in all in God. And sin is the opposite. It's the opposite. And we'll never work rightly without this. We'll always be backwards, disoriented, turned on our head without this reality. Sin disorders everything. Salvation puts it right back into the right orbit where God now is the center of everything. Praise be to God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every sin you're battling this morning has this at its very root, is self-glory that you're the son and everything exists to make much of you. That's what we're all battling in our remaining sin because that's what we all were in Adam and that's what we fight still with the sin that has not been annihilated. It's just been dethroned. We are created by God and for God. This is our purpose. God's passion for his glory is unmistakable from Genesis to Revelation. He's made everything for his glory and he's redeemed us for his glory, and we join God now in his great end to glorify him. And we start every day with resetting this truth and passion and pursuit in our lives. It's, a, it's very, I like that word, simplicity. It's not confusing, is it? It's just a simplicity. My life is for God. Gospel sim- simplicity dies to split motives. It changes everything. Thomas, thank you for picking that song. We didn't even... Communicate. Where'd he go? Wherever he is. Thomas. Um, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Everything we do will bring God's glory. And this is what happens when you see the kingdom of God and the king. It all becomes about him and his glory. And as I delight in him, he gets the glory for this. I love when James says, friendship with the world is hostility toward God. If you want to make yourself a friend of this world, you'll make yourself an enemy of God because the two are opposed, the glory of God and the glory of man in this world. So spiritual health will only come by singular motives. The encumbrances that we looked at in Hebrews 12 are mixing these motives. The, the weights that you're carrying are because there's, there's, there's things you want There's glories that you want and they're weighing on you instead of that singular motive. The sin which so easily entangles us is unbelief and it makes our motive self-satisfaction as our chief end. That's what your, your sin is doing. It entangles us to make that our chief end. So how do I keep my motive with simplicity of just looking to Jesus? I think the best illustration I could come up with is Jesus. He had gospel simplicity, didn't he? He had the single intention was the Father's glory. The the enemy can never move him away from his love for the Father and his desire. My my food is to do the will of him who sent me. You, You could not move Jesus from that single intention. I mean, the devil threw everything at him and could not move his heart from his father one iota. Even a cup of wrath he could look into and sweat drops of blood and just say, not my will, but your will be done. You could not move Jesus from that single intention 
of his Father's glory. What a, what a glorious, simple end and what this could do for our lives. This is not to make you miserable, but to bless you beyond belief. This is the best thing I could ever encourage you in. Enter into this simplicity of one intention, and you get simplicity and joy. Uh, you don't get a simple life. Life is complex. But with this simplicity, you can navigate all the complexities of life. Like, it's just, there's so many things that you're going through that I'm just stumped. But this simplicity boils through everything, and it just brings you back to the glory of God. So the first thing in simplicity, guys, is the simplicity of intention. And now I want to look at the simplicity of dependence. And this is where we really come back to John 15. This is what we were learning in the abiding. Do you remember abiding in Christ was to, to abide in the gospel, that in him is the righteousness that I need. In him is the, the soul cleansing power for all my sin. In him is my protection. In him is my strength to fight against sin. In him is my provider. And we just started realizing that in Christ, we, we have everything. He's the full vine and we're attached to it and we get a draw from his sufficiency and all that he is in our daily lives. Simply put, we cannot live for God's glory alone without the supply of Christ. So I, I've, I've gone out just, I want the glory of God and I run out and I'm going to go give it to him and I get knocked on my keister every time because I, I can't glorify God in Ken Murphy's strength. And so if you stop at the first goal, you're just going to destroy yourself. You're not going to get it done. And if I'm going to live a life that brings glory to God, what I need then is the vine. I need this trust and this dependence and this sufficiency that comes from him alone. Unbelief. <laughs> Unbelief is the complexity that clouds the vision and multiplies our difficulties in life. Faith is just a simple dependence. Abraham didn't waver in unbelief with the promise of a child. If God promised he'll do it, I trust him. Hebrews 11, all the Old Testament saints. So that there's just a simplicity of trust that God's calling his children to. And all that God promises to be for you in Jesus Christ. This book from cover to cover is so that you can trust in Christ. You can trust God. He's faithful to everything that he says and does. And if we don't do this, we'll look to the world to provide our comfort and our hopes. If Christ isn't it, you're going to try to find something else that will satisfy you. And we'll look at false saviors instead of the living promises of God. You'll, you'll run to all the lies. And since God won't act for us, I'll do it. I'll go fix it. I'll go solve this problem. It sounds like the garden where they're tempting Jesus. So spiritual insincerity then emerges in our hearts. An inability to fully trust God, I want you to hear this, creates a toxic duplicity of conduct that poisons the Christian life, said Newton. It actually, it's a duplicity of conduct that will start poisoning the, uh, James, he says, you're like a wave tossed about. I believe, I don't believe. Y your whole life is, is just unbelief to belief and it, it just, you, you'll never get anywhere in the godly life that he's calling us to. If I, I, I believe, no, I don't. I, I look at the scene, I doubt. It, it, we're not called to be this duplicitous. I believe, I don't believe. That's the battle. The simple trust is what we learned from Hudson Taylor of how to look to Christ for everything. And John Newton said, all our trials are aggravated by unbelief. And I'm going to add by idols. It, our idols and our unbelief just weigh us. By not trusting God, our difficulties of life loom larger, sting harder, and weigh heavier. And I've just been in the trenches with suffering in the last couple months like never before. And every one of them who lift their eyes to God find this comfort and help and peace. And when we look at the waves, the, the trial is 10 times harder. And so that's this simplicity of trust that we're looking at the gospel saying, I trust Jesus implicitly with my life. We live so far below our privileges by not trusting God. And what is offered to us in God as our Father through Lord Jesus Christ 
is what he's bidding us to. So I declare that life will have so much complexity to it, from marriage to parenting to just navigating life, but we can maintain simplicity by living into the gospel. What we have in Christ is ballast for the soul. The simple life in Christ is the abundant life. And we must fight for gospel simplicity. He's given us the means of grace to labor hard to rest in Christ alone. And so my simplicity of intention is I live for the glory of God. And the way I'm going to get there is by abiding in Jesus Christ who can give me all sufficiency to go live and trust in a whole different way. And that brings us to my main point. I want a gospel sincerity. Gospel simplicity produces something very beautiful. And it produces a sincerity without wax. And this is the fruit of abiding in Christ. You can be wax-free. This morning, you could be the, the real article, a son or daughter of God to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What this gospel does is it transforms us. The president of my seminary said, if the whole world told the truth for just one day, the whole thing would collapse. It's all built on lies, deception, insincerity, self, lust, greed. The whole world would break if just for one day, truth was told. This is the only cure for that. The gospel of Jesus Christ can redeem us from this bondage to the freedom of the sons of God whose private life and public life are equally oriented to the glory of God. You can't get this anywhere else. It makes no difference where you're at or who you're around. It will make no difference if you're in public or private. There'll be no difference because I am his and he is mine. I'm married to the bridegroom who knows all things quorum Deo. I live before the face of God. That simplicity of intention. This can produce that. John Newton said, For they who love the Lord above all and prefer the light of his countenance to thousands of gold and silver, you, you want him more than all the riches in the world, who are enabled to trust him with all their concerns, abiding, and would rather be at his disposal than at their own will have but little temptation to insincerity. The principle and motives upon which their conduct is formed are the same as, as in public as in private. Their behavior will be all of a piece because they have but one design. They will speak the truth in love. They will observe a strict punctuality in their dealings. And they do unto others as they would have others do unto them because these things are essential to their great aim of glorifying God and enjoying Him forever. May we walk by God's power in Christ for a sincerity. A sincerity. And so if, my whole ministry to you is this. The Christian character is not just conformity to external standards. I've been fighting you on this for 25 years. It's just not, I, I, I just live this standard. Here's the standards that I do. And, and you do all the external things. That's just what the Pharisees did. But deeply rooted in the simple motives and simple dependence in Jesus Christ of daily faith walking with him, we've found everything in Christ. And this is what will change and transform us from the inside out. The truly authentic Christian life is the life of faith, and it's exemplified by the gospel simplicity, waiting on God alone, receiving all from Him, rendering all to Him, resting in Him, and acting solely for His glory, said Newton. This is it. This is the freedom of the sons of God. When the conscience is clear and the heart is simple, Newton said, neither the applauses nor the anathema 
of worms is worth two pence per bushel. <laughs> you don't give a rip what unbelievers applaud or, or condemn you. Because you, you just have an audience of one. And there's just this freedom for the glory of God. Thomas Boston, the Puritan, said, Men pleasers and those who please Christ divide the whole world. The people who seek to live to be pleasing to God finds himself uncomfortable and out of place in this world like a pilgrim, so to speak. I pray for sincerity. And the only way to get there is the glory of God abiding in Christ. We can now begin to be the same person wherever we go because we live before our God and we want his glory over our less. What is available to us will bear much fruit. This church will bear much fruit. And in closing, I want to look then at what he called the simplicity then of treasuring. Give me some motives. Help, give me strength for this. To obey sincerely is a supernatural phenomenon growing out of daily communion and adoration of Christ and all his sufficiency. This is going to come by, by communing with Jesus, having that relationship we've been talking about, having fellowship with him. We're right back to the true vine again. And I got some long quotes just hanging in there. There's only three more. Four. Newton said this, I wish we may learn from all our changes to be sober and watchful, not to rest in grace received, in experience or comforts, but still pressing forward, children of God, and never think ourselves either safe or happy but when we're beholding the glory of Christ by the light of faith and the glass of the gospel, to view him as God manifest in the flesh, as all and all in himself, and all and all for us, this is cheering, this is strengthening, this makes hard things easy and bitter things sweet. This includes all I can wish for my dear friends that you may grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus. To know him is the shortest description of true grace. To know him better is the surest mark of growth in grace and to know him perfectly is eternal life. Jesus is the chief end of this life. This is where we're fixing our eyes and running. This is the prize of our high calling, he said. The sum and substance of all that we can desire or hope for is to see him as he is and to be like him. And to this honor and happiness will surely bring, he'll bring all that love his name. We adore Christ for his imme immeasurable love that just as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And as we do, the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus simplifies the Christian life by focusing our attention on this treasure. It's just behold, love, treasure, adore. And as we sit by faith in the adoration of Jesus Christ, he said, all acts of obedience, the hard things and all our trials, the sour things, take on a new sweetness under the illuminating glow of Christ's transfigured glory. This sounds amazing, but I'm walking with saints daily who are doing this. It's not beyond you. It's the power of God by those who are abiding and they're doing this. Gospel simplicity is inseparable from great joy and pleasure of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I might gain Christ. He's better than life. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. God's all-sufficiency in Christ is the only basis for single-minded obedience. All else, he said, is poor pretense or a lifeless show of religion. Just externals, dead, nothing. It's just beholding this Christ and knowing and loving, keeping him before you is going to bear much fruit and it's going to bear gospel sincerity and it's going to make you a man or a woman after God's own heart. So the conclusion of the matter, we must have a simplicity of intention. We've been born again that God's glory is the only reason I exist. And there's some things you're wrestling with this morning that you want more than God's glory. And this is the gospel to bring you back to the simplicity. 
I want the glory of God as my main goal. And then second, we must have a simplicity of trust in the vine that everything I need for life and godliness is found in Jesus Christ. I, I live into that. And then third, we must have a simplicity of affection that though you do not see me, you love me. You're beautiful, Jesus. And this will bring about the simplicity of sincerity that we'll live the same wherever we are and we'll bear much fruit because our life is for God. Newton wrote a, a summary letter that I'm going to read. He said, A single eye to his glory as the ultimate scope of all of our undertakings. The Lord can design nothing short of his own glory, nor should we. The constraining love of Christ has a direct and marvelous tendency in proportion to the measure of faith to mortify the corrupt principle of self. The beauties of Christ can start mortifying this principle of self, which for a season is the grand spring of our conduct and by which we are too biased after we know the Lord. We have a hangover of self that keeps fighting us, he says. But as grace prevails, as we abide, self is renounced. And we feel that we're not our own and that we've been bought with a price. And that is our duty, our honor, and our happiness to be servants of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To devote soul and body, every talent, every power and faculty to the service of his cause and will. To let our light shine to the praise of his grace to the place, to the place our highest joy in the contemplation of his adorable perfections and to rejoice even in tribulations and, and distresses and reproaches and infirmities, if therefore, thereby the power of Christ might rest upon us and be magnified in us, to be content, yea, glad to be nothing, that he might be all and all, to obey him in opposition to threats or solicitations of men, to trust him, though all outward appearances seem against us, to rejoice in him, though we have nothing else to rejoice in, to live above the world and to have our conversation in heaven, to be like the angels finding our pleasure and performing his will. This, my Lord, is the prize, the mark of our calling, to which we are encouraged with a holy ambition continually to aspire. It's true, we shall still fall short. We shall find that when we would do good, evil will be present with us. But the attempt is glorious and shall not be wholly in vain. He that gives us thus to will will enable us to perform with growing success and teach us to profit even when by, by our own mistakes and our own imperfections. He who began a good work will complete it. Our communion with Christ is the greatest happiness that we're capable of. And this happiness opens the way of obedience for us. And the delight of communion with Christ he says, the will of God opens for us and obedience is called forth. Meaning, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's the call of the Christian life. And so, I'm going to give you John Newton's very last conclusion in closing. He said, if I had to search out the world for the godliest Christian on the face of the earth, he said it would not be the eminent Christians or even the public Christian." would not be a pastor, a seminary professor, or an author. The greatest Christian in the world, Newton supposes, is most likely a man of faith who just barely survives in this world thanks to a homeless shelter and the meager employment he finds on the lowest rungs of the social ladder. Or perhaps Newton speculates the greatest Christian is a bedridden old woman in a mud cottage who's learned through years of trials to adore Christ and trust him in his timing and everything. Low thoughts of self and high admiring thoughts of Christ are the sure marks of the godliest Christian, even if such a Christian is likely unnoticed by the world and overlooked by most Christians. The best models of gospel simplicity are the poorest and the weakest Christians who have been emptied of all their self-sufficiency and who have learned to fully submit their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, His will, His wisdom, and His timing. Amen? So as I close, I, I pray that we would have gospel sincerity 
at Southside Bible because of our intention and our trust in Christ. And if you've gotten off track, that even this morning, just a reminder of repenting before God and saying, God, I, I want to live this way. I want to live the same when I'm at home and when I'm away, when I'm on a phone and when I'm not. I want to I wanna live for your glory and there's no change because you don't change. And so just a repentance before God and come back to that chief end and that dependence on Christ who is able to let this flow into our lives. And if you've come this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, I just want you to hear what Jesus is offering to you. He's offering to take you from this slavery of living your life for you as the chief end. It's a miserable life. And you just, the world will not love you the way you want it to. And you just keep going from thing to person to event. And, and God has come to set you free from that bondage so that you could be saved back to him. And the only way you'll ever work is the way you've been designed is to have God at the center of all of your life. And you can't do that because your sin has to be dealt with. And so God sent his son into the world and he went up on a cross and he died the death that you deserve for your sins where the father pierced him through for your transgressions. And then Jesus came and he perfectly obeyed God. And God will give you that record this morning as if you did it. And most people say, I would do anything to have that. And God says, I want you to do nothing but hold out an empty hand turn away from trying to fix it in your own strength, turn away from your sin and your life of trying to make it for your glory and turn and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And he'll reorient your whole life to start renewing and transforming your life one day at a time by being brought back into the favorable presence of God. That is what he offers to you this morning. I pray that you would come to Christ and believe in him and look to him alone to pull you out and save you this morning, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you should be saved. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now, if there's any in this room that need to call, God, let them cry out to you in the quietness of their heart. Let them say enough with sin, enough with the death that it's done in my life. God, let them cry out to Jesus Christ. Surrender and believe in him and come to him even this morning. Put an end to the misery and the pain, and the suffering of living life without you. God, heal their souls even this morning. Heal their lives. God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for all of us, for the insincerity of our life. Let us come back and stare at the blazing glory of you, Father. Set our life only for that end and to abide in Christ and look to him to have power to go live for this glory everywhere we go. Let us not have duplicity. Let us not have wax. Let us be sincere in all that we say and do. The one thing that just fills this room is a sincerity of love to you and love to each other. God, boil off phoniness and hypocrisy and the fakeness that remains in our flesh. And God, by Jesus Christ, make us sincerity of faith and heart. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.